my friends, Jill Osborne from the Interstitial Cystitis Network, and I'm here with a very special guest, Dr. Martha Boone. She is the author of a brand new book called The Un fettered urologist. Now, for those of you who live in the South, those of you in the New Orleans area, the odds are you've heard of Dr. Martha Boone because she was absolutely beloved as a urologist treating IC. Uh, but as happens with all of us, we all get to the point where it's time to move on. And in her case, she has now retired. That said, the blessing of this book is it carries the wisdom of decades working with urology patients. So welcome, Dr. Boone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, and thank you for all of your work over the years. Oh, it is a labor of love. And I think that that's very true for your for your practice. And that's really what shows to me in this book. One of the things I love about your book is you position it by saying that this is everything you wanted to say to patients that you didn't have the chance to in such a small meeting. Yes. I can't imagine how it must feel to know that you've got, let's say, an IC patient who's struggling with very, very severe pain, and you just want to be there for them and, and help them as much as you can. But healthcare the way it is today, you might not always have that time. I think it's very frustrating for both the patients and the doctor. I mean, I remember so many times having my hand on that doorknob thinking, you know, someone two doors down was bleeding or I had to get to the operating room or someone was having a hard time in the ICU and there just wasn't enough time to do everything we needed to do. So that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is to be able to tell the patients the things that I couldn't tell them when I had to run out of the door to take care of an emergency. And I think too, the challenge with a typical pelvic pain patient is that they're in crisis. They're in crisis mode. They're in anxiety mode. I certainly was when my pain was very, very severe. And um, sometimes they just need some comforting. You, you, I know for me, I didn't understand why I was in so much pain. And I was just thinking, this is it. My life is over. I won't, yeah. I won't have a future. Yeah. And to have somebody say, Jill, this is treatable don't worry, we're going to get you better. I'm going to help you on that way, right? That's kind of the dream doctor appointment for patients. Yeah. I think the fear factor is um, huge, particularly with chronic disease, because the patient starts to think, oh my God, I'm always going to be like this. I'm never going to have a normal social life. I'm never going to be able to work. I'm not going to have the attention to take care of my kids because the pain robs you of your energy. And, you know, people can't sleep and they're just never themselves. And I think the fear is calmed by someone who can give them the time. And like you said, to just let them know there are things we can do. I can remember in my first year, I asked my wonderful urologist, I said, just take it out. I don't care. <laughs> take it out. I don't need this bladder anymore. And he's like, Jill, calm down. We haven't even done anything yet. You haven't even tried the most basic treatments. And I'm so thankful for him because, yeah. because I am now pain-free and I have been pain-free for years doing some very, very basic things. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. We did take people's bladders out for a few years. We thought that would solve the problem. And what we learned was we would take out the uterus. That didn't do it. We'd take out the ovaries. That didn't do it. We'd take out the bladder and give them a diversion. That didn't do it. Right. And it was very powerful because it gave us a hint that part of the problem was in the nerves and not actually in the end organ. And I think with interstitial cystitis, we're treating more than one disease process. And I think for a long time, we were just using one you know, tool to treat what was basically a range of disease. Exactly. I think that the, the recognition that this is not an incurable bladder disease in everyone, that this is in fact a pelvic pain syndrome for which there are many potential causes is the best thing that could have happened in the IC world because we're no longer condemning patients to a bladder treatment, an antidepressant, a diet, and sending them on their way, especially if it doesn't work, because it didn't work in, mo in many of your patients. Right, right. Yeah. I would say that with just any treatment we had, I think we had about a 60 to 65% success rate. 
And that's pretty low. I mean, most things in urology, it's 85 to 90 percent success rate. So I think that's another reason why the patients are frustrated and some of the doctors are frustrated because we don't have anything that works a large percentage of the time. We have something we have treatments that work about two thirds of the time. And so that's a bit of trial and error. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today, I mean, patients can't afford to take time off from work. Mm -hmm. They're using up all their vacation and doctor visits. I mean, it's just a very frustrating process because it's it's unusual for the very first intervention to be the one. Usually it's a couple of things before we find out exactly what an individual patient needs. So this brings up my favorite, favorite thing to talk about right now. And this concept of phenotyping or subtyping. I mean, I, I can still remember I was I, I'm going to say like 15 years ago maybe even 20 years ago at an NIDDK IC meeting. And Rhonda Cotterinos, who was the first physical therapist to really speak out about the role of muscles in IC, came to a national meeting and they wouldn't listen to her. Yeah. And, and yet when the National Institutes of Health did that clinical trial that they released back in 2000, in the late 2000s or 2008-2009, which showed that pelvic floor physical therapy was remarkably helpful in treating many patients. That to me is a, a bellwether moment because yes. that made everybody go, uh-oh, wait a second. Muscle therapy works? Maybe this yeah. isn't a bladder thing in most patients. I mean, I remember the first few patients that I sent for pelvic floor physical therapy. I carefully researched these people because I knew that there was going to be a big difference between the kind of physical therapist who would treat someone who was going to have a knee surgery or who had had a back surgery mm -hmm. was different from the kind of person who would understand the pelvic floor and be able to work on that. Mm -hmm. And the first few patients I sent, I remember getting phone calls from their gynecologists going, what the heck are you doing? You know, we sent them over there for you to evaluate their bladder. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I am evaluating their bladder, but I really feel like the pelvic floor is a problem. I mean, when I did their vaginal exam, I could feel, mm -hmm. you know, the muscles contracting. And when I asked them to relax, they couldn't relax them. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel like this is a big part of, you know, the treatment. And gradually over time, over about a decade, people started to realize that this was a very valuable part mm -hmm. of the treatment of pelvic pain. And really, if you think about it, let's say any organ is injured, what happens? You know, you try to splint it with muscle spasm. So even if the problem were only the bladder, treating the muscle spasm around the bladder and around the pelvic floor could help the pain syndrome, even if you didn't even believe that it was primarily a pelvic floor problem and not a bladder problem in some patients. Tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. Um I think a healthy pelvic floor muscle kind of feels like a raw chicken breast. It's got substance, but it's kind of soft and pliant. But whereas a dysfunctional tight pelvic floor muscle feels um, almost like beef jerky and it's tender to touch. How would, it, it, would you consider that a good description or how would you change that description? <laughs> I've never thought about it in those terms, <laughs> but now that you mention it, I think that could be applied. I mean, the thing that was impressive to me is when you would ask a patient to tighten around your finger, that yeah. frequently you, they would already be so tight that they wouldn't have much more to add. Yeah. And then when you would ask them to relax, frequently they could not. And, um, you know, there was the point tenderness that you could feel in different areas also mm -hmm. in, in the muscles of the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. I know that when I do my internal work, um, um, I look for... I can absolutely feel the difference. The tight muscle is it's taut, it's tender to touch. It's um, it doesn't, it's not um, pliable. Yeah. And I really, you know, just by massaging it and getting that muscle to relax and release, it's, it's so mind blowing to me that I now have control over what causes my pelvic pain. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing we didn't figure this out because I mean, we all know that if you do this, you know, your neck and your <laughs> shoulders get frozen and you either have to go for massage or you have to go to the chiropractor. So why would we not realize that it was the pelvic floor? And I remember that years before I actually was certain that this was part of it. I can remember patients telling me, well, it gets worse when I do the elliptical. I mean, you would have mm -hmm. thought that that would have mm -hmm. blown, you know, a light into your head. 
But physicians, we are invested in believing that whatever we were taught is true. I mean, most of us are students until we're about 32, 33 years of age. And so we believe our professors. And so whatever they pass down to us, you know, we've spent yeah. so many years doing it. We've done so many tests to make sure we're proficient in it. So we don't necessarily think outside of the box. And I think that's what's required with an IC patient. You have to open your mind. You have to really listen because nine times out of 10, if you can really listen, they will give you the clues to what is triggering their problem. Mm -hmm. And you have to develop a relationship because there has to be trust there. This is a very intimate part of the body. Mm -hmm. And without that trust, the patient's not going to tell you everything that you need. And if without the belief that you're really listening to them, you're not going to get the, the little nuggets of information that are going to direct you down which path to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My favorite question to ask patients when I'm working with them is, is there an event that you associate with the onset of your symptoms? Because I think that in, like, like you said, we have to listen to the patients. And, and in many case, cases, the patient know exactly what triggered their first symptoms. I can remember I was working with a 23-year-old young man who was bedbound. I mean, he had to drop out of college. And I said, you know, and I, and I just said to him, I said, what do you think triggered it? He goes, I know exactly what triggered it. I fell off a ski lift. That night I had my urinary symptom. And it surprised me that nobody had ever asked him that question. I called it the inciting event and I would put mm -hmm. it in the chart. And, mm -hmm. you know, it could be anything from childbirth to having had a catheter for a gynecologic procedure to, you know, a laparoscopy. I mean, in some patients, it was something psychologically traumatic. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it was an event that had happened to them many years ago that had triggered mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I remember a patient had been in a motor vehicle accident and mm -hmm. she had jammed her feet up against the the area in front of her the floor rest in front of her and she said that night you know she started having the symptoms so yes I think asking about the inciting event frequently led back to what might be the best treatment to try first in that patient okay let's go back to this concept of phenotyping so now um uh, there is growing 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 belief that there's diversity in this patient population and at least at our National Institutes of Health in our, in our national IC research effort, they are agreeing that there are at least three different types of patients. Although uh, Dr. Christopher Payne proposed five and Curtis Nickel just earlier this year said he believes that there are nine distinct patient groups. Wow. So in the National Institutes of Health system, there is bladder wall, pelvic floor, and widespread pain. Okay. And we're kind of now going, okay, now we know why so many clinical trials failed because you can't put apples, oranges, and bananas in the same study or in the same treatment and expect the same results, right? Yeah. So, so let's talk first about the bladder wall kind of hunter's lesion group. Yeah. So the two gentlemen that you um, mentioned, I respect both of them and they have, oh my God, just a world of experience with this. Yeah. So I trust what both of them say, but in my experience, the patient with the Hunter's ulcer was rare. I mean, I, mm -hmm. in the first 20 years of treating IC, I was afraid of missing a bladder cancer. So I was doing cystoscopy on everybody, even if someone else had already done it. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking in the bladder. Mm -hmm. And so the hunter's ulcers were rare. And then the other thing about that is when it became, you know, popular to resect them, I would only get about a 50% response rate. I mean, so if that were the problem, I would expect it to be better than 50%. So um, that was a rare situation for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in my practice. Yeah, it's, it, it's really interesting because I mean, research studies are kind of all over the place, and they're also talking about the skill set of various people in terms of do they know what a hunter's, ulcer, a hunter's lesion looks like. Some people could describe it as a crack. Some people describe it as a round wound. Some people describe it as a stellate appearance, kind of a star shape appearance. But the, the greater mystery is why do they happen in the first place? Yeah. Do you have any, do you have any insight on that? Any guesses? Because everybody's guessing at this point in time. 
Yeah. I mean, back when I was first a urologist, you know, the, the mast cell thing was all the rage. And so we were all yeah. certain, you know, that it was mast cells. And so when I would send the lesions off to pathology, I would have them very carefully look for that. And that just didn't pan out. Right. And that was one of my first hints that, you know, the things that are in the literature may not be correct. And that was kind of the first thing that made me start really thinking outside of the box. So the most common finding in my pathology specimens was that there would be acute and chronic inflammation. Exactly. You know, what caused that? I mean, a viral infection, a bacterial infection, you know, something they ate. That did, I mean, what could have caused that? Mm-hmm. So I found it to be a very nonspecific finding. And, you know, in the, uh, in the maybe 20 to 25 percent of patients that removing the ulcer would give them some kind of relief. Um, I really didn't find it to be the panacea that I'd hoped it to be. Right, right. Earlier this year, but we knew this about five or six years ago, that it was the Europeans who first started finding hints of viral uh, infection in patients with Hunter's lesions. And they found the polyoma virus, which is a very common virus, and then Epstein-Barr. And our own U.S. National Institutes of Health did their own viral study, and they too found that about 5% of IC patients did have active polyoma viral infections, which is very interesting. And two, uh, about two or three months ago, we had another study from Europe where they started testing an antiviral for patients who are demonstrating active viral infections in Hunter's lesions. Did you ever find active viral infection in any of your IC patients? No, but I didn't have any good tests to look for right. them. So, you know, right. it could have been there and I might not have recognized it. Right. Um, so right. I would have to say no. I mean, I didn't, I worked in a private practice um, after my first six years of being a urologist. And so I didn't have research protocols like the other doctors that you mentioned. I right. mine was a clinical practice. Of course, of course. Mm-hmm. So what was your best treatment or care strategy for patients with Hunter's lesions? What did, what did you find to be the most effective for them? So we would resect them. And then if they did not get anything from that, we would look at what all had been tried before. Mm-hmm. And I always started with the least invasive thing. I mean, I tried the pelvic floor physical therapy. I tried all the over-counter medications. Mm-hmm. I got probably a 40% improvement with dietary changes um, mm-hmm. that that never, you know, totally panned out for most of my patients. And I don't know whether it was that they didn't completely follow it or whether the diet was just ineffective. But most of the time, intravesical therapy with the rescue bladder cocktail would help most of my patients after the hunter's ulcer had been resected. Okay. It was hard to get people to stick with that because of what I mentioned before. I mean, anytime that they came to the office, they were taking vacation time. Mm -hmm. And insurance, you know, did not want to cover everything. And so one of the things I talk about in the book was that we taught a number of our patients to do that on themselves at home. Right. And they would actually purchase the product at a compounding pharmacy to try to save them money and to give them some empowerment over the whole situation, which helped, you know, with their depression and their anxiety and their fear, because they knew if it got bad on Friday night and they couldn't get into the office, that they would have something that they could do at home. And so I don't know how much of that was calming down their fear and anxiety so that things did not get worse and worse and worse versus what was really treating the bladder symptoms. Um, <laughs> that's, but we had good benefit with that. There, there is tremendous irony. I, I, in fact, Curtis Nickel talked about it in his nine, nine phenotype proposal. He said, you know, his, his, his thought was, why do flares happen on the weekends? <laughs> I, and, and so he, he's, he basically set, set up a rescue installation clinic in the afternoon on Fridays yeah. to help patients get through that weekend if they were flaring. And I thought that that was, that was pretty amazing. Yeah, we had, we always had a few appointments open on Monday morning. I would always have them leave a few appointments open so that we could get people in. Right. And um, for the most part, I tried not to operate on Monday morning because I knew we would have, you know, a flurry of activity during that right. time to try to get people settled down. But, you know, I cannot tell you how many business women would call me from China. And, you know, what I did was I would give them a whole list of things to do. They had their travel drugs that they would take with them. Right. And, um, you know, it was everything from bladder numbing agents to pain medicines. I mean, it was whatever they they needed, you know, that, that right. helped their symptoms that they would always take with them. And we had plan A, B and C 
And then we had yeah. the Monday appointments if that didn't work. And, you know, you have to admire the courage and the strength of those patients who, despite really uncomfortable, I mean, traveling is so painful, um, to have the strength and endurance to go out and do the things that they need to do to live their life and to make their money and to pay their bills and to earn their health insurance in the face of really great adversity. And having Hunter's lesions, is, it can be very, very significant adversity. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to our next subtype. So our next subtype, bladder wall driven. Pain is a bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. For IC Awareness Month this year, we're focusing on those patients struggling with genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Those women who present with frequency urgency pressure pain in their 40s, in their 50s, maybe after hysterectomy using Lupron, who have all the symptoms of a UTI, but it's not a UTI, and they get diagnosed with this incurable bladder disease when in fact it's actually just estrogen atrophy and not a disease process at all. Yeah. Did you? Uh, to me, that's just a huge chunk of patients out there. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I had so many patients that had been terrified to use any kind of estrogen product. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would read the package insert and just be certain that, you know, I was giving them bad advice. Mm -hmm. But the ones who would try it, I mean, frequently I would call their gynecologist and I would actually talk to them and say, is there any contraindication? Mm -hmm. You know, and I would have them use it. And I found the minimal amount of time would be at least three nights a week that they would mm -hmm. use the intravaginal estrogen before they went to bed. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of patients, it would take between four and six weeks before they saw full clinical benefit. Mm -hmm. So between the fear of any kind of estrogen product and the fact that it took a little while for it to work. I mean, there was the occasional patient that in the first couple of nights of using it, they would go, oh my God, you know, this is a miracle. But most people, they would be using it for a while before they'd really be able to see the clinical benefit. But I saw so many patients helped by just using that. And when the trial came out, when the... Um, research project came out years ago saying, you know, that, that estrogen was associated with breast cancer, which I really don't believe much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, women just threw away their estrogen. And I mean, it was like the zombie apocalypse in my office. Yeah. All the women that were in there with frequency and urgency. And the gynecologist and I had been arguing for years about how estrogen affected the bladder. And they were just certain that estrogen really didn't affect the bladder. And I was like, okay, well then let me give your phone number to all these people who are showing up in my office. Yeah. yeah. Threw away their estrogen and now they can't stay out of the bathroom. So I'm absolutely certain that the two things are related. Um, and yeah. it took, you know, another decade before yeah. folks got on board, but now the gynecologists are treating, you know, bladder symptoms with topical vaginal estrogen getting great results <laughs> well and i think i think kind of on the on the on the patient side as compared to the clinical side there are still a lot of women who they're given the topical estrogen but they don't know they really don't know why they do not understand that the urethra and the bladder are estrogen dependent just like the vulva and the vagina yeah. And, and so some of them stop their estrogen after two weeks because they're like, well, it's not helping. Why should I do it? Yeah. Right. And my answer is always, it's the quality and health of your skin. You know, estrogen loss changes our skin and we want to get that skin as healthy as we possibly can be. And that's what that estrogen will do. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the other mm, kind of pickle I think it had to be a pickle in your, in your practice are those patients who basically have a completely normal cystoscopy and yet they have extreme frequency urgency. So let's take that patient, no Hunter's lesions, no pelvic floor tension, uh, estrogen, not an issue. This is a patient who clearly has neurologic driven frequency urgency. Those had to be really challenging patients for you. Well, they did very well with neuromodulation. Oh, okay. Yeah, we did peripheral neuromodulation on many of them. And for two years, I did it and never even charged the patients because I couldn't quite believe it was going to work. Uh -huh. So I would pay out of my own pocket for the supplies. 
and the local rep would provide the machine because he just knew one day I was going to realize it worked and then you know we would be off to the races because I had been doing central neuromodulation for years right know, doing sacral neuromodulation but that was a little bit drastic for the average patient you know they, they weren't ready to jump into that and right. so frequently they would have tried three or four of the overactive bladder drugs. They would have tried the bladder numbing agents. They would have tried the intravesical therapies. Mm -hmm. And when none of that worked, some of them would agree to go along with the sacral neuromodulation. And we got good results. If their symptoms were predominantly frequency, urgency, or urgent continence, those patients did very well. If their mm -hmm. symptoms were predominantly pain, the results were abysmal. I did not get good results when the symptoms were predominantly pain. But um, with the peripheral neuromodulation, you know, the patients were willing to do that because they didn't have to have an implantable device. Um, they could come back to the office once a week and get treatment. And we got good results with the frequency and urgency from that component. And that was very valuable to them because when they could get a good night's sleep and not get up to go to the bathroom every 20 minutes, mm -hmm. then they could cope better with their pain and get through their day better. Mm hmm. So I was just listening to, gosh, what was I listening to um, last week? And they were talking, they were really talking about the brain bladder connection. Yeah. And I, I don't think that we have good educational materials, which really help patients understand how, for example, trauma, how stress, how anxiety, how, uh, that upregulates the nerves, not only in the pelvis, but then eventually throughout, throughout the body. And that kind of creates that vicious cycle of anxiety, stress, frequency, anxiety, stress, frequency. So when we think about the, the ner nervous system and the bladder, I mean, all we have to do is look at neurologic diseases like Parkinsonism and you know, multiple sclerosis and diabetes. And we can see that the bladder malfunctions in those diseases. A lot of times, even in multiple sclerosis, the first presenting symptom will be frequency, urgency, and urgent continence. I mean, patients will show up with that before they ever have the other neurologic symptoms. Mm -hmm. So we know that the central nervous system definitely affects the bladder. Mm -hmm. And then as far as like the anxiety, I mean, if you increase your sympathetic tone, you're going to tighten your muscles in various areas of your body. And people have different propensities. You know, some people it's the shoulder, some people it's the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So anything that you can do to lower that sympathetic tone is going to be helpful. And so I had a lot of patients who would go for hypnotherapy. You know, I had a very good hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. I used pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, some people went to chiropractors. We had one particularly good chiropractor that worked with the pelvic floor patients. Um, we had massage therapists who were great at working with that. Mm -hmm. But hands down, the best technique was um, was meditation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had the hardest time getting the patients to embrace the breathing techniques and the meditation. Some of them would go to yoga and they would do these very intense yoga routines, which would make it worse. And mm -hmm. so I would try to explain to them, you know, no, we're looking for the more relaxing forms of yoga. And there was right. actually a pelvic floor physical therapist here in town who ran a yoga class once a night. I mean, once a week that was very, very popular with a lot of the IC patients. Mm -hmm. But I think anything that can calm us down, it would help, you know, with all of the chronic diseases like migraines and fibromyalgia and pelvic floor dysfunction. Well, and that brings up, you know, our widespread pain phenotype. And these are the patients who have I see IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, fibromyalgia, migraines, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm one of those patients. I mean, I had my first urinary symptoms in seventh grade. I couldn't, in fact, it was my teachers who complained to my parents that I kept asking to use the restroom. Ironically, I'd broken my tailbone that year. Oh. So now we know what my, you know, I mean, 40 years later, now we know what created the entire foundation for that. But yeah. Back then we didn't. Back then their answer was urethral dilations, which I had. Oh, oh I had weekly for two years. You that know? was one of our worst ideas ever. That was, I, you know, I, I, exactly. I mean, it's it's so ironic mm -hmm. now that it, it, we now know to ask, "Gee, why is the urethra tight in the first place?" Oh, yeah, the pelvic floor muscles. But back then, as you said earlier, they didn't really focus on muscles. And then because my muscle tension prolonged, was very long, 
I mean, at, at decades, my muscles were tight from that injury. I ended up getting vulvodynia, which was a irritation of the, of the nerves in the vulva. It felt like having a yeast infection all the time, even though there was no yeast found. And then it just kind of spread. And I think that when you're the patient, it's so confusing. Because by the time I was in my 20s, I did not have a normal life. My friends were out getting married and having babies. I was laying in the fetal position in my bathroom with cramps. And um, what the, the blessing that we have now is now we understand exactly why that happens. We know that after, and what the research shows is that for about 80% of the, of the children that eventually develop these multiple pain conditions, that there is a major physical trauma like breaking your tailbone, being hit by a car. And then for the other 20%, the research shows that it's a history of, of abuse or bullying. Yeah. And it's so important that we take the shame away because oh, I was yeah. ashamed. Yeah. And, and now I know it had nothing to do with me. It was never my fault. No shame, no blame. I was hurt and I was hurt really badly. I mean, I really broke my tailbone. Um, but now as a patient, we have to understand the neuro neurological and muscular uh, ramifications of that injury yes. and focusing on calming nerves down works. And, and, and we get to now explain to them why meditation is so important because it calms these nerves down. Yeah. I, I, one of the pleasures of retiring is that I have the time to read basic science research. Mm -hmm. Literature and research is happening so fast that we cannot keep up with it. I mean, it is happening <laughs> at an exponential rate. And I'm able now to take the time to read basic science research that I couldn't read before. And so I've recently been reading about the concept of an amygdala hijack. And what it talks about is how we, with our thoughts, can create a traumatic event. Mm -hmm. That traumatic event triggers the amygdala, which begins to secrete all of these neurochemicals, which tighten our pelvic floor and do all of the things that happen to us, you know, decrease our immunity, all the things that happen to us when we're stressed. Mm -hmm. And that it actually occurs before that information goes to the cortex or the frontal lobes for consideration. So we don't get the chance to recognize, oh my gosh, this is not a current problem. This is something from the past. This is based on fear and settle ourselves down. But the point of power is that with meditation, we can become more conscious of our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to get IC patients nationwide, worldwide to do one thing, I would say for about three days, just monitor your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Just pay very close attention to what you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. And then in meditation, try to release those negative thoughts mm -hmm. because all those fears of I'm always going to be like this. I'm going to lose my husband. I'm going to lose my job. I can't take care of my kids. All those thoughts trigger those neurochemicals, which make all those symptoms worse. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of basic science information out there that is supporting that what we're thinking creates how we respond to any kind of disease process. And that is so powerful. And, and, and uh, absolutely. And also kind of helping us understand the concept of trauma informed care. Yes. Because the brain re remembers everything. And so if something, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of patients who, when we you know, I, we're going over the, the subtypes or the phenotypes. And I say, so do you have other pain conditions? Yeah. Okay. Do you have really sensitive skin? Yeah, I do. Do you have a wicked sense of smell? Can you smell things that other people can't smell? And just smells drive you crazy. They're like, how did you know that? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> well, because I have that too. Do you know what that is? Okay. That tells us that you have a very sensitive nervous system. And so therapeutically now, what we want to try to do is we want to try to calm that down. But one of the classic signs of that widespread sensitivity is catastrophizing. Right. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. And that was probably the number one thing that I did not have time to talk to the patients about. Yeah, I mean, they would have a litany of things that they were sure was going to happen and they would be practicing this over and over and over again. And a short office visit, if you said anything to kind of deny anything that they were saying, that would destroy that trust level. They would think you weren't listening. You didn't hear them. You didn't understand. And this is where I really try to get my patients to consider psychology or psychiatric care mm-hmm. um, because they schedule for an hour. The psychiatrist is also the doctor who knows all the medications that can decrease that pain syndrome. I mean, things like those old tricyclic antidepressants. I mean, in very low doses, those things helped so many of my patients. Mm -hmm. And I, as a urologist, was prescribing those things because my patients wouldn't consider psychiatric care because they felt angry that the doctor, you know, was inferring that maybe it was all in their head. And how carefully I would try to explain to them, no, this is the person who can schedule a one hour appointment. This is the person who knows all the most up-to-date medications that might, you know, not give you too many side effects and might help you with this upregulated nervous system. But for whatever reason, that was the toughest thing. I, I could oh. not get most patients to even consider doing that. Well, I, I at my very first appointment, uh, my doctor said, I would really like you to go talk to um, a psychologist. And I was furious. And I have a master's in psychology. It's like, I'm up all night urinating yeah you do not even suggest that this is all in my head there's something physically wrong with my bladder and yet he was absolutely right you know i did not i did not understand the research i you know all you had to do is look at my history of these multiple pain conditions plus anxiety and catastrophizing classic signs of somebody with central sensitization and that was the concept of mindfulness Listen, that's why I'm better is I dove in to all of that. Yeah, Check it really out. requires multimodality treatment. I mean, I, I mm-hmm. fantasized for years about having a clinic where absolutely everybody was there. The GI doctors were there, gynecology was there, urology was there, psychology. I mean, that would be my ideal. And um, I think a few people around the country have tried to set that up, but it's been very hard to get reimbursement for it. And it's expensive. Um, but I think that would be the best type of care model for the pelvic pain IC patients. We have to explain it in context that nobody is saying to you, the patient, that this is all in your head. What we're saying is that you have a central nervous system injury. They call it a maladaption. And that injury occurs after a major physical trauma or it can occur after an emotional trauma. Right. And so, yeah, not just her physical tissues damaged. But nerves, nerves become compromised too. And all we're trying to do is calm these nerves down because aren't you tired of living with anxiety? Aren't you tired of being anxious all the time? I think there still is a lot of stigma around psychiatry and I don't know how that got started and I don't know what we can do to relieve that. But I think that that, that was a big problem for my well, patients. Yeah, I think, I think we're getting there. Unlike you, where you were confined to 15 minutes, I can take an hour or two with a patient. Yeah. And once I kind of walk them through the anatomy a little bit more and that history and how that changes things, and it's like, this is why we want to do mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's just, we have to recognize that strength. <laughs> the gift of getting older <laughs> and menopause is that your anxiety levels tend to peak up a little bit. And the the advantage I think that, that I have, although I have to work on it daily, is I have tools to not let it take over my brain anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I can stop it. I can stop the negative thoughts. I've got some really good, simple, basic tools that I can do, but they still creep in every now and then. I take every January, I take seven days to monitor my thoughts and it is the hardest seven days of my entire year because I really really try to pay attention and every year something sneaks up on me I mean about two years ago I realized that I was in the belief system that I was old and I was starting to think you can't do that because you're old you can't do this because you're old and I didn't even recognize that that was coming to me and I and I 
think that that we pick things up from the outside. You know, we hear things coming from other places. And so I think if you are a sensitive person or you have this upregulated nervous system or whatever exactly it is, I think you have to be very careful to avoid toxic people. I mean, I recommended to my IC patients, stay the heck away from the news. You know, don't catastrophize, don't rehearse all these, you know, they're coming to get us and this is bad and that's bad because you can find those ain't it awful people, you know, that's what I call them, that will just chronically tell you this is terrible and that's terrible and this is terrible. And that's very bad for anyone with a chronic medical condition. And I find that even with myself, that I will take on some of that stuff. And so I kind of do that cleaning act to remind myself that my thoughts can create problems. Mm -hmm. And I saw it a lot of times, even with people, women who had recurrent bladder infections, they would start to worry about their vacation, or they would start to worry about their business trip to China, or they would begin to worry about something. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, they would lower their own immune system, and boom, they would get a bladder infection. Mm -hmm. And we would see it with women, even with happy things, you know, about to get married, about to go on the dream vacation, about to have a honeymoon, boom, they would get a bladder infection. Mm -hmm. And then it would just trigger their whole I see system, but it started out with those catastrophizing thoughts. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a terrible honeymoon mm -hmm. because I'm going to get a bladder infection and then the IC is going to flare and, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I really think a lot of the time it did start with what they were telling themselves about what was going to go on. That's why I love Norman Vincent Peale. I can remember yeah. when I was in the, the, the worst of my pain and was just cycling down um, I went to a local bookstore and I was just the sweet little you know, apple doll of an owner, you know, it's kind of was crying on her shoulder. And she said, honey, I need you to read this book. Then it completely changed my life. Norman Vincent Peale is kind of the power of positive thinking guru. And he said that if you dwell in the negative, you're give, that's, you, that's where you're telling your brain you want to go that you are you are predetermining a negative outcome. If you're assuming the worst, you're not giving your brain anywhere better to go. Yeah. This is why we use positive affirmations. I can do all things through my faith, which strengthens me. Or every day, in every way, my life is getting better. And I loved what he ha had us do is write our favorite affirmations in a little file on um, file cards and carry them with us. So whenever I went to the doctor or whenever I was walking into a situation, which is very scary, scary to me, I just pulled out my file cards and I just read them. I just filled, I reversed, I reversed the negative self-talk to positive talk. Just I have these um things that I call my gratitude beads. Um, and I've been doing this for about 12 years. And what I do is I have a little bead. It's almost like a rosary, mm -hmm. but I have a little bead for each thing that I'm grateful for that it reminds me of. And it's people. And I mean, it's simple things like my eyesight, you know, the fact that I've got teeth. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> simple things on there. And, you know, I try to do it just about every day. Yeah. And now after 12 years, I have 176 things on there. So if I find myself perseverating or catastrophizing or going down that negative thought path and my meditation process doesn't calm me down, I will get out those gratitude deeds and I will just say them like someone would say a rosary. And, you know, it calms me down and it reminds me that most things are really good. Ooh, and I that, love that you know, idea. I can work through this. And, you know, one of the things I loved about my IC patients is because they had worked through so many terrible times. Mm -hmm. They had strength and they had things to offer other people. I mean, when we could get them out of a flare, I mean, many of them were brought to greatness from working through these problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether they were teachers or nurses or parents or whatever they were, you know, they could use that information to help other people. And so, so many were able to turn that suffering into something good and positive. I mean, you're an amazing example of that. But even Thank in you. smaller ways, there were a lot of people that were able to use their suffering to, you know, help others. And I, I, that might sound trite for somebody who's in the middle of a flare, but I did watch that over and over and over again. Uh, that's one of the blessings of facing this very, very difficult time. And I say to patients, the blessing that this is given to you is that you will be a better friend. You will be a better mother. You will be a better partner because 
you will never walk away from somebody in pain. Right. You will be there for them because you know what it's like to be up at night alone. I, I tell you, the, the moment that turned me around um, was I had, you know, my IC was out of control. Of course, I didn't understand it at all. My mom and I went on a train ride. It's just like I wanted to get away. Not having a clue. Getting on a train is about one of the worst things you can do when you're in pelvic pain. Like, <laughs> right? Oh, my gosh. I ended up at Lake Tahoe in the emergency room. Uh. And then my mother had to drive me home as I was riding in the backseat of the car, stopping in snowbanks to pee, right? I mean, hysterical. I go to the emergency room here and I had a doctor say to me, you will forever be a burden on your family. Oh my God. No, really. This is absolutely the truth. This is your life. You will always live with severe pain. Get used to it. And that was a moment as appalling as that was that I went, oh, a second i have three college degrees i will prove you wrong how dare you say that <laughs> and and that was the moment i came home and i started studying yeah because i i i i was not going to be a burden on anybody yeah. and and i am very blessed that it gave me a career that i love you know, that I respect. I, I think the other thing that was so interesting is I had no respect for the work that I was doing prior to this, working for a nonprofit, and then I was working in, in pharmacology. I, I just didn't, I didn't see value in it. And I see value in the work that I do now to be able to be that hand, to be able to give that hug to somebody and to let them know it's not your fault. You've done nothing wrong. No shame, no blame. Let's see if we can try to focus on underlying cause so that we can fix this. That's one of the things I loved about being a urologist is, I mean, I had meaningful work. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I felt incomplete. And that's why I wrote the book, because I felt like, oh, my gosh, there's so many urologists, gynecologists out there who just don't have the time mm -hmm. to give the patients that last 45 minutes they need, you know, to have all the information. Do you feel, though, because I can remember there was a very famous female urologist out here in California, and I asked her if she wanted to be on our doctor list, and she said, no, I don't want to be the one everybody sends our IC patients to. I want to do surgery. And I was really surprised by her kind of lack of compassion. And yet mm -hmm. every doctor has their own interests. And it's yeah. a special doctor to have an interest in pelvic pain because these are challenging patients. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think the frustrating thing is that what I said before, the treatments work about 60 to 65 percent of the time. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it requires a lot of return visits mm -hmm. and um, it requires a lot of patience on both sides. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did not specialize in IC. I mean, my original job was reconstruction, which is big surgeries, you know, making bladders yeah bowel you know that was basically what my training was and I was doing academics but what would happen is in whatever community I would be in the urologist wouldn't want to take care of IC and so they would just send them to me mm -hmm. so like your moment where you went home and you said I'm not going to be a burden on somebody I decided well if they're going to send me these people I need to figure out figure out how the hell to help them and so <laughs> I would go to every AA meeting I mean AUA meeting that yeah. had you know, anything about IC, I would go there and I would talk to, you know, all the, the experts to figure out what they were doing. And I mean, I got a lot of cuckoo ideas that really didn't work. Yeah. But at the time I would read the world's literature on this topic every year and, yeah. you know, partner with my patients to try to th find things that would not hurt them, would not break the bank mm -hmm. and would give them, you know, some assistance. And I became very proud of the fact that I could help people that other people couldn't help or wouldn't help. And um, I had to keep the new patient appointments down to, you know, a minimum because I could, I just couldn't handle it all. I mean, at one point I had a five state referral. I mean, people, there were ladies from a church that came in a bus one time <laughs> to see me. <laughs> so, but, you know, I had to, I had to manage it because it would take over because the other urologists would just send them to me. One of the things that the patients didn't realize is that a urologist is a surgeon. Mm -hmm. We do general surgery. 
and then we do urology. And so we have between six and eight years after medical school that is surgical training. And that's our predominant job. Mm -hmm. Taking care of something like IC is almost like a hobby to a urologist who doesn't Mm -hmm. specialize in it. And so we will have frequently been up all night doing a kidney stone case, or we'll have someone that we did a cancer surgery on who's in the ICU. Mm -hmm. We'll have somebody bleeding after a kidney surgery. So we have a lot of emergencies. We have patients in the hospital. We have patients in the emergency room. So a lot of times when they come in for their office visit, it's not like internal medicine or primary care where we're just taking care of the people in the office. We frequently have two or three things going on in the background. And we get emergency consults to go to the hospital to help gynecology. So Mm -hmm. our day is different from a general medical doctor. It's the Mm -hmm. life of a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And so it would be fascinating to me, you know, in the same day, one patient would come in and go on Google and talk about me as if I were God. And then two or three hours later, another person would go in there and say, you know, I was arrogant and I didn't care. And, you know, they just lamb blast me. And nine times out of 10, it would be that someone in the ICU was doing poorly and I was worried about them or someone had shown up in the emergency Thank room you. and wasn't going to be able to get there as quickly as I could. Yeah. So to kind of just recognize that we are surgeons and that is our basic framework from which we right. work. And I think to improve the success of working with a doctor who does see IC, if they have a nurse practitioner or a PA who's kind of dedicated to taking care of that, who's in the office most of the time, I think the patient would be more happy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, anytime you go into any business angry or frustrated, you know, you're you're going to scare whoever you're talking to and they're going to be interested in getting away from you. Mm-hmm. So any kind of breathing or meditative techniques that the person could use in their car before they go into the doctor's office and make sure that they write down their questions so that they can get what they really most need and prioritize them. You know, what is that first question you really want answered? What is the second question you really want answered? So that you're organized and use your time, you know, in a very valuable way. Mm -hmm. And recognize that the urologist, the kind of person who chooses urology is not the same kind of person who chooses primary care or chooses psychiatry. Mm -hmm. It's an action person who wants to do something. And so urologists are, it's particularly general urologists, we're more likely to offer you a procedure than we are to hold your hand and say, I'm sorry, you're having a tough time because we're not, we, we weren't selected out for those skills. We were selected out for that eye-hand coordination and that ability to make a quick decision and that black and white thinking that is typical of surgeons. Mm-hmm. So if the patient can recognize what kind of doctor they're going to, And then if they choose to see an OBGYN who sees some IC patients, recognize they may have been up all night delivering a baby. They may have two ladies at the hospital that they're afraid are going to deliver at the same time and their partner's over at another hospital. And so they got all that going on. So a lot of times when the doctor seems distracted or not particularly focused on you, it's not that they're thinking about their stock market, you know, figures or anything like that. I think nine times out of 10, they're thinking about another patient that they perceive to be more acute. And so I think, you know, if you go back to see someone two or three times and you're just not getting what you need, then that's definitely the time to look for someone else because you don't need that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And if you see in their reviews the same kind of complaints over and over and over again, then, you know, you may need to, to look for someone else. But I find particularly in the really busy practices that a good nurse practitioner or PA who's being guided by the doctor and overseen by the doctor is a real valuable person for an IC patient. Mm-hmm. What are the things that you think patients should be attentive to that will improve their overall odds of success from a self-care standpoint? So a lot of the things that I saw people were unwilling to change was, number one, they wouldn't go to psychiatry or psychology. They just Mm -hmm. had a block of that, would not even consider it. Mm -hmm. Number two, they would not separate from toxic people. I mean, I saw patients who had, you know, a kid who was on heroin or a husband who was alcoholic and, you know, they would not separate from these toxic people. I mean, I had one patient who had a verbally abusive boss. This guy was never going to get any better. And for whatever reason, she couldn't, wouldn't leave him. So there's some codependency issues that people were not really willing to address. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw people who were working 80 hours a week. I mean, if you've got a chronic illness of any type, you have to accept that you can't do everything that you want to do. I mean, that that could be contributing to why you're not getting better. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was lifestyle changes. 
-hmm. Most people that I saw were willing to make dietary changes. I mean, I had the occasional patient who was drinking three quarts of cola a day and they weren't going to change <laughs> that. But, you know, most people would change simple things like that. Yeah. But the things that, that they were most stubborn about were <laughs> mostly lifestyle changes and being willing to go to psychiatry or psychology. When you think about the model patient, if there's a dream patient that you get to meet for the very first time who's struggling, how would you describe them? So they're willing to recognize that they're probably going to need more than one modality to take care okay. of the problem. So they're open-minded. Okay. Second thing is that they recognize that this may take a little minute. Um, they're in pain. I know they want to get out of pain, but it may take a little while for us to find the thing that works for them because it's it's an individualized care kind of a thing. Um, the ideal patient also is willing to kind of work on their own emotions. You know, like you were talking about a minute ago, mm -hmm. try to learn some breathing techniques, try to learn some meditation, you know, work on calming themselves down so that we can actually have an interaction that would be helpful to them. So those would be three of the characteristics. Dr. Boone, thank you so much for appearing thank with us too. today. We really I'm so appreciate glad we it. finally got to talk. I know. <laughs> life, <laughs> even life has been challenging the last few years. I'm <laughs> finally glad we were able to. And for anybody who's watching, you can now get the Unfettered Urologist right on Amazon. Are there any other places where they can get this book? Yeah, I've been looking. It's uh, at Barnes and Nobles. It's at Walmart. It's at Target. Um, oh. By on my website, I, I would like to mention my website. Oh, um, go for it. Um, it's www.marthaboone.com. And my favorite small bookstore is on there and they have signed copies if anybody would like that. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds yeah. great. Well, thank you so much. And we'll thank look forward too. to talking with you again. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye <laughs> now.